Whisky. 3, 2, 1, stop. Pour moi, je suis prêt à démarrer les moteurs. Tu vas démarrer en allant dire pour les moteurs. Alors pour le 1, c'est ok pour le 1. Welcome to Airbus. Welcome to the We Make It Fly Airbus podcast. I'm Jeff Burridge, and in this series, we bring you the fascinating stories of the people that have played a part in making Airbus the extraordinary company that it is today. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the journey. I'm at the Dubai Air Show, and I've left the bustling city and skyscrapers 30 kilometers away to come to the air show site today. I'm sat at the Airbus Pavilion. From where I'm sitting, I can see the impressive static display of commercial and military aircraft. We've got the Fiji Airways A350, the Egypt Air A220, the Emirates A380, we've got a corporate jet, a 319neo, and we've got A400M and C295. It's pretty full static there. This is one of the biggest gatherings of its kind in the Middle East, with over 80,000 trade visitors expected through the week. And it's been a great show for Airbus. We've announced orders for every member of the family, including $16 billion deal for 50 A350s with their Emirates. In between signatures and announcements, we've seen some impressive flying displays, the Patrouille de France amongst them. We've also had the pleasure of the A330neo gracing the skies amongst many others. You'll understand by now that the Middle East is a key market for Airbus. We've been long-term partners for many years. Commercial traffic here is set to double in the next 10 years. Defence and space provide a wide range of products and systems in the region. Eurofighters, military aircraft, satellites. On satellites, telecom satellites more specifically, Arabsat, Nilesat in Egypt, Yarsat in UAE are all amongst our customers. That brings me to this week's guest. And Martin Aguera went to meet him at the home of space in the UK at Stevenage. Let's have a listen. So here I am. We're in Stevenage, which is the main site in the United Kingdom for Airbus Defence and Space. And I'm here in one of the buildings, which uh, shows an impressive display of the telecommunication satellites that are being built here, that have been built here decades ago until today. And it's quite an impressive display of technology, obviously here in mini format, but they're actually built here and uh, this is what the people do. I'm here to meet with Colin Painter, who is the Managing Director for Airbus Defence and Space in the UK, and I'm very excited about that. Martin, hi. Hey, Colin. Welcome to Stevenage. Thank you. Good to see you, Colin. How are things? Things are good, actually. Yeah, very busy here today. We'll have a look around the, the site in a minute. It's a, a very vibrant site today. Absolutely. I mean, I could just see it, uh, the, the display here of, you know, the satellites that have been built here over the years until today is, is very impressive. You must be awfully proud of, of the technologies that are being built here and the people that are actually yes, building these. I think for me, I'm proud of the team. You know, we've had a tremendous history here, um, right back to the days of uh, BAE and Marconi in the UK coming together and then Astrium and uh, EADS and now Airbus as, as owners here. Uh, it's been a, a really fantastic history um, spanning back 50 years. Can you describe Airbus Defence and Space in the UK? I mean, how many people are working in this sector and what does it actually stand for? Well, we have in the UK around 4,000 people. We are, I guess, almost two-thirds to three-quarters of those are associated with space. So we're by far the largest UK, uh, by far the largest space company in the UK. And then around 1,000 people working in defence. So, and that spans from cyber through to the secure communications, through to A400M, and where we are today in terms of Stevenage and Portsmouth in terms of designing and manufacturing world-leading satellites. And you've been at the helm of this business for 17 years. You're about to step down from that post at the end of this year. So a lot of this, what you see here, is something that you uh, actually probably built up with your team over the years. What inspires you still to this very day? I'm an engineer at heart. So working with, incre you know, and, and building incredible products that are going to go out of the Earth's atmosphere and even to another planet, it, it is inspirational. But over the last 17 years, it's really the people around here. We have some amazing people. Um, just a few weeks ago, I gave a long service award to somebody who'd worked here for 50 years. 
So joined at 21, he's 71 now, still passionate, still really gets up in the morning and wants to come to work for us. It's truly amazing dealing with people like that. And, it, and, and they inspire me to do better in my job every day. Once you're in this environment, once you see what the products we produce, once you meet the people and discover the passion, discover the real you know, science and engineering we're pushing forward here, I never wanted to leave. Okay, so we talked about the passion. Let's have a look how it's actually being done. Yep, let's go. Let's look at our great products. So we're here in a very long corridor. Where are we exactly? Yes, yeah, so we're in the central corridor where all the manufacturing, starting with uh, small products, um, panels, antennas, um, and then we develop it into the main clean rooms uh, down the end of the corridor where we'll look at uh, complete spacecraft. If I look here, there's a, I see an exhibit of Skynet. This is what actually brought you to space back yes. 17 years ago. Yes, uh, in 2002, I, I came in as the CEO to drive the um, early years of the Skynet systems development after winning a very significant contract. It's, it's a military satellite at its heart, or four military satellites, providing worldwide coverage um, and supplies communications, protected communications, resilient communications, for our UK Armed Forces wherever they are in the world. We've uh, developed and uh, built and launched four Skynet 5 spacecraft. They're all working very well in orbit. And the uh, British Ministry of Defence trusted us sufficiently to uh, buy that office as a service. So we own those four military spacecraft. We own the ground systems, the equipment on ships and uh, land vehicles, and we provide a whole service to them. Uh, we provide their military satellite communication. So let's continue going down the corridor quickly. We see here a lot of people working on what looks like panels. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so a spacecraft is made up of a structure and then a payload. So we're building the structure here in Stevenage. The panels are the sides of the spacecraft where we'll fit the electronics. We're not producing 800, 900 aircraft a year. We're producing tens of satellites over the course of a couple of years. And, and they, they are all bespoke. Customers want slightly different things on them. It's not a standard product. So therefore, the automation versus the human skill is a balance we have to maintain all the time. So let's go now and look at the clean room where we're assembling our satellites here. It is a clean area. We'll have to get uh, kitted out into the full clean uh, and protective gear and we'll go in and have a look at some of the satellites we're building today. All right, let's have a look. So, okay, we have to get suited up now to go into the clean room. Um, this is incredibly important because uh, when these uh, spacecraft uh, go up to space, uh, there's no um, gravity and any particles that are left on the spacecraft will float free, could interfere with the electronics uh, and cause really you know, chaos to the spacecraft. So it's really important. Don't touch anything. Just stand by the spacecraft, put the protective suit on and we'll be good. I'll do my very best not to break anything. Um, and what is also interesting is you have to follow a specific order. So we have to start with the hairnet. I'm going to put that on right now, followed by the overall. The team are a lot quicker than this, Martin, every day. They do it. change for lunch, you know, coffee breaks and things. They're very quick, very efficient at doing this. Right, we're all suited up correctly. Let's go on in the clean room. Okay. This is one of our largest clean rooms in Stevenage, where we assemble the, uh, not only the telecoms spacecraft, but also the uh, Earth observation and science platforms that we do here. What are we actually seeing here right in front of us? Right, so this is uh, a uh, telecommunications product. It's the main structure we're looking at here, which uh, will host uh, 
the propellant tanks and the uh, payload module will sit on top of it. So this is the basic construct of the satellite. This satellite we're looking at here will provide a huge number, maybe up to 300 TV channels over a region of the world. This satellite here will be something like five, five and a half tons when launched. So it will be a, a, one of our bigger satellites. Colin, here you assemble, you integrate satellites. When they're ready, they're being up, sent up to space. Most of the time at our main facility in Kourou, in uh, French Guiana. I'm sure you've been there many, many times. What does it feel like? The first time I went to Kourou, it was a night launch. The jungle's extremely noisy at night. And the thing I remember more than anything else is before you could see the engine uh, light, the jungle went absolutely silent. It's like all the creatures in the jungle knew, sensed something was happening, and it went completely silent. And then you saw the flash of the main engine lights. Then you saw, then you had the tremendous sound. And we were five miles away from, from launch. And I don't think you, and you feel rather small. And, you, and, and, it, and it sets into context what you're doing as a job, you know, where this thing that you've worked on, this thing that, you know, hundreds of people in the organization has worked for is, is, is then going to burst through the atmosphere and spend the rest of its life, you know, in space. And it's a very humbling moment to watch a launch like that. We talked space here. Uh, we talked about the things that are going to stay in orbit. Now, Colin, you're going to take us to another part Uh, here in Stevenage, where things are being produced that actually leaving the orbit and going to another planet. Indeed, let's go. We're walking through um, into our Mars rover area, uh, and attached to the Mars rover area is our STEM center, which is I'm extremely proud, personally proud of, um, where we have groups of school children uh, come and do lessons in the area, uh, learn about space, learn about engineering and, and mathematics, etc. in a very fun environment. Um, the uh, best person in the class can get to drive the Mars Rover as well as a special uh, treat, and they can look at the Mars Rover doing its trials in our special Mars Rover lab. So we're very proud of this. It's in partnership with the local education authority. Uh, and it's used almost every day. I guess here is where you lay the groundwork for the next generation of engineers. Right? Exactly. We um, are working with the government to promote uh, science and technology and engineering courses. Um, and we believe you can't start too young. So a lot of the children here are um, under 10. And it's just getting them excited about engineering and science in the UK. And it sounded like they are excited. Yes, they are excited today. Wow. I'm looking through some very big glass windows right now, and it looks like a desert. Tell me, Colin, this must be Mars. Yes, this is, this is Mars. We're looking at our Mars lab. This is where we're testing the Mars rover that we're priming from Stevenage. Uh, which will go on to the surface of Mars on the ESA program in 2021. And this is perhaps our most exciting project at the moment, and we're developing all of the algorithms for it to drive around Mars uh, in a semi-autonomous way, so it can decide on the best path across the Martian landscape and go further so that it can look for organic life, look for signs of water in the past on Mars. So let's walk through and go on to Mars today. So we're here now on the uh, sand. It is fascinating because we're just about to see uh, Bruno, which is the Mars rover prototype, and it's going to be uh, in action in just a second. That's pretty impressive and incredible to witness. It's moving at a rather slow pace, but I heard you say uh, to me earlier that it actually is moving quite fast um, in, in actual terms. So it's, it's moving backwards, forwards, turning left and right. So I guess it can do pretty much everything. Yes, it, it's, it moves at around two centimeters a second, and it has six independent uh, managed 
wheels, mm -hmm. so it, it can uh, go over rocks of various sizes, or it can maneuver itself around rocks. Um, but we are pretty confident now that uh, this is an excellent product. It's been really well tested um, uh, by uh, the European Space Agency and ourselves, uh, and we're just looking forward now to getting it launched and getting it there. It just shows space is a forward-looking business. You don't stop where you are. You're always looking ahead already at the next 10, 15 years, right? I think that's actually why it's important that it's inside Airbus because Airbus, from all it does, takes a long-term strategic view. And space is the ultimate long-term strategic view. Um, the, the, the exploration of Mars will be a 25, 30-year um, journey, uh, and we're seeing one major part of it today, but it's just a part of that. It will continue for many decades to come. Colin, you've been working for 17 years in the space industry. You've seen a lot, obviously. What makes working in the space industry so special and what makes it so challenging at the same time? It's a really difficult question to answer, but for me, the technology will always move forward and we've seen some amazing technical developments in materials, in, in electronics, miniaturization, etc. But for me, the last 17 years has been very much a human experience, working with the people here, the passion they have for pushing engineering boundaries, developing solutions so the scientists can explore more on different planets has been really captivating to me. Uh, and when I retire next year, I will really miss that. It's the interaction with people who are so passionate about their, uh, their work. We have a lot of debates in Europe about the role of space, whether you know, we should invest in, in, in space. Um, Europe has to make decisions right now what role it wants to take in the future space race, if you want to call it like that. What would be your recommendation? What should Europe do? What should the UK do? I think we've talked about many aspects of space uh, today. Um, space affects everybody's life on Earth, and it will only, that will increase, that will only increase the, the amount of um, interaction that involves an orbital infrastructure. It, it's not just about you know whether mankind should explore its universe, um, and obviously I you know I'm biased, but of course we should explore that and push the boundaries. But it's all also about improving people's life, people's life in society. I think is incredibly important from from positioning in the you know in in, in the uh, precision timing, navigation. Um, you know, f fifteen of the of the seventeen sort of uh, climate. Um, uh, key performance indicators are measured from space. So space is doing the health check of Earth, really, every day. And uh, it's really important that we look at that science and, 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 and develop that. And then communications and the broadband uh, environment, um, being able to use phones, being able to use and communicate with one on a mobile environment, all of that relies on the space backbone. So I think it's only going to grow, it's only going to continue. And there's no question in my mind that we should invest more and do more uh, in that environment. And where do you see Airbus's role in all of that? Airbus is the largest space player in Europe. It has tremendous talent all around Europe in all of our home, four home countries and beyond. Um, it, it, it's at a leading edge now. Um, it's made some tremendous investments. Uh, I know people talk about old space, they talk about new space. My view is that Airbus is is in real space. You know, we've invested in OneWeb. Uh, we're going to do that uh, low orbit constellation. That's going to be a fantastic achievement. We've invested in a range of new products uh, over the last few years, some of which we've talked about already. It's just an astonishing position. We can build on that and be a real powerhouse for Europe as, uh, as space develops and as Airbus develops. Colin? Thank you for taking the time with us today and all the best for your um, you know, next step in life. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to Colin and Martin. I like hearing about the Mars rover. It seems that the next space adventure isn't so far away now. Exciting times ahead. This episode is the last of our series. Martin and I have both enjoyed bringing you a small selection of some of the great stories and people from across our amazing business. We hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. 
And if you've not listened to some of the earlier episodes, then I encourage you, go back and have a listen. This program was made by Earshot Strategies. The executive producer is Richard Myron and other production undertaken by Anouk Mie. I'm Jeff Burridge and I was joined by Martin Aguera. Thanks for listening. Thank you.